Space Marine 2 is set in the 42nd millennium. Imperium of Man has launched a galaxy-wide and a decade-long campaign with the goal of reclaiming lost worlds from its enemies. And guess who shows up? That's right, the giant party poopers known as the Tyranids of Hive Fleet Leviathan. And they want to tear into a new buffet, and the Ultramarines are in the way. A proverbial bone to throw into the craw of the beast that's barreling down on all of humanity. These are just some of the enemies that Titus, hero from the original Space Marine game, will face off in Saber's Space Marine 2, coming out September 9th, 2024, for PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X and S, and PC. The atmosphere and presentation of Warhammer 40k, it's a unique beast, a mix of historical warfare that never really advanced past the blow the absolute shit out of everything and we can worry about cleaning it up later phase. The Warriors of Man genetically altered heroes three feet taller than an average man, trying to consistently keep at bay a combination of enemies that include aliens, their own politics, and the psychic power of the warp, all the while fighting to take and keep, or retake and keep, or destroy so someone else can't keep, planets that the Imperium of Man have claimed across the galaxy. And the atmosphere in this is just present from the moment you turn on the game. This is a world where they build cannons right into the side of churches because praying to your god isn't enough. They have to occasionally shoot at him just to remind him of how pissy they are. Space Marine 2 easily surpasses most games in the sheer number of enemies it throws at you simultaneously, rivaled only occasionally by World War Z in its newest mode. However, when it comes to the total combatants on screen, Space Marine 2 excels, especially in the ones that you can battle, not even including the ones that are just in the background. The game masterfully showcases these vast distances filled with swarms of creatures charging down hills towards ramparts. Tyranids flock like birds darting through the air and across the ground in enormous groups, sometimes bolstered by massive genetic monstrosities of their larger brethren that carve through enemies like a chef knife at the end of a rough day. Combat is visceral when it comes to the animation and the movement, blocking, grabbing enemies mid-attack, tearing them apart and using their body parts as weapons to kill others feels great. These warriors, they're more than mere soldiers. They're mechanized tanks, over eight feet tall encased in specialized steel with bodies hardened for war. The game offers a sense of momentum, weight, and energy all the time. Explosions illuminate the screen and it sends bodies flying across the battlefield. You have bolters kicking in your hand with each shot. The first time you kick an 11 foot alien in the chest, you can almost feel that force, the inertia of the impact in the movement. Yet the finer details are also here, watching a Space Marine's eyes scan the display as you prepare to land during a mission, followed by a slight head movement to reset his gaze. It makes the display, which is often just a narrative device in a lot of these games, feel like a real integrated part of the experience for both the player and the actual characters themselves. Or the look at Titus's face of effort and strain when he picks up a creature by the tail and uses it like a mace against its own brood brothers. Texture work is also excellent, with huge amounts of detail across armor sets, the skins of creatures, from rock to gravel to faded paint to cracked and peeling wood, the facial detail, the landscapes, the locations, the characters, pretty much everything. Each location across the world uses all of these parts to create something that feels unique yet at the same time familiar regardless of where you go. From the jungles and swamps of one planet to the ancient graveyard Saturn moon of another. While they're not necessarily large, many of them do have branching pathways. They all usually lead back to the same spot. It does open some strategy up when it comes to the direction you may want to work through when you engage in combat. On a 4090 with a 7800X3D, 64 gigs of RAM, it got well over 120 frames per second almost every scene with small drops here or there. While it does have DLSS and FSR, both of which I used and they work fine, it doesn't have frame gen, and I was actually quite astonished at just how good it ran with this many creatures on screen. On the lower end PC with the 3080, performance scaled pretty much perfectly. It's also not really RAM or CPU hungry at any one particular time, other than one or two fights with different enemy types engaged in a massive battle across a huge plateau. The game's strength in its presentation and in its world form is focused via the game developers understanding of what Warhammer needs to look like, something that the original game did as well. And even if there's a spot that isn't, even if there's a moment where it seems to drop just a little bit of its presentation, the very next moment it replaces that with something even cooler. Just very impressed with the entire presentation here. Clear a blast radius. We will inflict upon the traitors such agony, the likes of which they have not seen since the burning of Prospero. They will suffer, they will break, and they will fall. Sons of Gilliman, for the glory of Ultramar! For the glory of Ultramar! 
Take long. Major, I have a second unit working on a theoretical that should buy you some time. My lord! I've lost three squads trying to reach that lab. We think something's out there. Noted. The samples are good from bolters to boots on the ground, and the 3D audio is nailed in. During battles, there might be a fight where some POS Chaos Marine is going to teleport into the area, which you can track instantly via audio, regardless of where you're looking. And that's a huge help, as they don't waste any time attacking the moment their entry is complete. If there's any complaint I have with this game, it's that three times where environmental audio just seemed to turn off, leaving just the voices and the gun sounds and characters and I had to reload the level to get it to come back. It's unfortunately there. I hope they do fix it. It wasn't something that completely destroyed my fun because I pretty much assumed I needed to just turn the game off and turn it back on, and it would work, and it did. It's something I wanted you guys to know about. Something more important, though, is it also required a bit more adjusting to get it dialed in in the sound effects options. The game seems to have a heavy reliance on adjusting the audio as you move through different locations. Some of them had some kind of adjustment going on that seemed almost too aggressive, quieter than I would have liked. Nothing too noticeable, but I also wanted to bring that up. When it comes to the music, you're going to have to nail this. You don't want a game about giant war men pummeling everything into dust to degenerate down into just pure comedy. And it could actually remove a bit of that gravitas and that's a difficult line for you to step across because this is a game where characters have power swords have two stances because apparently hitting someone with a five foot electrified sword isn't good enough you have to have a stance that just lets you hit them harder it's a mix of male choruses tribal beats during combat and more expected orchestral elements when going through story moments if the musical identity of space marine was aiming to be intrinsically tied to its look it actually did a pretty goddamn good job and there were some surprising bits here in particular, story points that turn and the soundtrack begins to churn out an almost superhero kind of tension building string section of quick back and forth chord hits making your way to the dropship. That initial soundtrack you heard just a moment before sits with you a little bit as you try to figure out why was that playing? There's something a little bit mysterious about the music here and how they play it out and definitely a mix of styles I wasn't expecting in some places, but still phenomenal. When it comes to the voice, Mark Strong's been replaced by Clive Stanton, who worked as Rolo in the Viking TV show. It's not really a detriment to the character or the delivery, a delivery that offers more flexibility and more emotion than the original game did for reasons I'm not going to go into here. Additionally, even the smaller NPCs, both physically as the normal humans have a ton of voice lines in this game, as well as just less of a spotlight, are done well. But in the major moments, Titus's teammates shine. And they don't have the easiest delivery, regardless of their strengths or weaknesses when they talk or their characters themselves. You got to realize all these guys are basically talking in a heavy warlike pig Latin for the Space Marines. Let us go to the pig Maximus Iacus Shittercus. It all makes everything sound even more epic, but everybody has to deliver that with the right kind of style for it to not sound hilarious. And they do a really good job and they keep the seriousness of war to actually feeling, well, like war. Let's talk about the story and the gameplay, reintroducing Titus as this wild card. And remember, he was once this renowned Marine. Titus was accused of heresy at the last game and sent for interrogation at the end of it. However, he was eventually allowed to join the Death Watch where he completed some extraordinary missions. And at the starting of this game has now returned to the Ultramarines. And this story arc works exceptionally well because the Ultramarines are loosely inspired by ancient Roman era with the structure of pretty deeply rooted in honor and trust. And Titus's initial choices made him suspicious among his peers. And his return amplifies that tension. Even if he was judged as somebody who wasn't involved in heresy, they still always question it. The game uses this historical influence to create what is actually a fairly compelling narrative where Titus's role as both a hero and an outcast adds these layers of intrigue to it. You may miss, and if you do, it's no big deal. But if you pick up on it, it actually adds to the story. And that story does move pretty briskly, rarely slow slowing down with occasional returns to the battle barge for updates and plot progression and ending up talking to the characters there. The magnitude of what unfolds here is astounding, not as a hint of specific plot points, but as an indication of the epic scope of the narrative. Even with the trail of bodies marking the hero's path, Warhammer Space Marine 2 manages to resonate by pushing the limits of what I believe epic storytelling can achieve within the Warhammer world. It's not going to win awards for its distinct writing or its detailed delivery, but for Warhammer fans, of which I'm one, it hits incredibly hard. Warhammer has always been a game that defied expectations by just going bigger and bigger whenever it seemed pretty much impossible. And by the end of the game, 
you feel a little bit of that extra excitement, not just as a Warhammer fan or a third person shooter enthusiast, but as someone who appreciates unrestrained, unapologetic action. To me, this is a story of redemption, revenge, and ultimately responsibility. And it's a grand adventure that fits perfectly within the Warhammer universe. It's filled with massive boss battles, personal struggles, and the endless war that defines Space Marines existence and what makes them so much fun to play. And fun to play is what matters. So let's talk about the combat. Now, combat in Warhammer Space Marine 2 is a blend of ranged and up close attacks, allowing you to seamlessly transition between shooting stunned enemies and mastering up close weapons like the Thunder Hammer, the sword, and my personal favorite, the Roaring Husqvarna style chainsword, perfect for carving through enemies. And each of those weapons also comes with a sprinting entry move, adding a dynamic twist to engagements or the ability to get out and then get back in again. The combat system offers a pretty streamlined repertoire of moves, reminiscent of God of War light, but with a hefty mix of firepower from plasma guns and various bolters to sniper rifles and more. While ammo can be scarce for some weapons, an eight foot tall Marine who can punch an enemy so hard to practically defy gravity always has something to fight with. Dodging in any direction is crucial in this game as Warhammer's battles can quickly turn into the world's longest traffic jam of bodies. And that is one thing that the spawn engine delivers well. And that is just the sheer amount of anarchy going around you at any one time. So dodging through enemy attacks can result in completely avoiding damage, while weaker attacks can be parried, shoving enemies back or triggering these brutal finishers on smaller foes. The moves allow you to slam enemies into their comrades or tear them apart, maintaining the relentless pace of combat regardless of what you're doing. The ability to react quickly, switch between all that, and exploit your surroundings turns pretty much every encounter into a really incredible time. And that's just as Titus. When you jump into the other modes, you get to take on other character archetypes and classes. Some of them have cool things like uh, jetpacks, which you guys know, one of my favorite things in the world. But how well does it all come together? Well, let me put my money where my mouth is here. I beat the game with the HUD almost completely off, both in the normal mode and the extra up mode. That was a little bit harder. While the game always likes to display the colors for unblockable enemy attacks and a couple other smaller indicators by simply paying attention to the game world and the sound and what your characters are doing, playing this without the HUD worked incredibly well. While the three modes have different overall progressions as well to get through the story elements or take out enemies and complete the main goal or to take out other players in campaign operations and multiplayer respectively, most missions, especially the campaign mode, play out somewhat the same. That means you're not solving puzzles like some futuristic Alan Wake. You're saving lives or taking them, then dropping into a hot zone or coldly taking out humans who've come under the control of the cursed aliens, planting explosives one level and punching through a forest because it's blocked the next. The game's a series of mini explorations in contested zones, constantly stopping for battles before pushing forward again through another one. Fight, fought, or fighting, it doesn't really matter. It's all somewhat the same. And this is a one note game in that way. And I want you to be aware of that because while I liked it, I could see a lot more people playing this game and thinking, is that really all there is to me? I would say that might've been all I ever wanted. I would say that, but there are a couple issues. First, the bots still do even on the harder difficulty have a tendency to either leave you hanging or work unintelligently through a forest of giant alien legs to try to get to you. This means in the story mode in particular, enemies always hunt you down first and don't exactly spend a lot of time or CPU cycles aiming at the other members of your team. This can be noticeable in boss battles. In addition to the single player campaign, the game does have these other ones, and it's obviously less of an issue there. It includes a three player co-op mode called operations and a PVP mode featuring six V six battles with various game modes like Annihilation and Seize Ground. Now, the PvE levels also change up slightly in enemy variety and placement, and that's aside from the difficulty levels you choose. That's a nice bit of variation, and it's something that you may notice when you check different difficulties on the campaign mode. It's just less noticeable. To dive in, you pick a class between Assault, Bulwark, Heavy, Sniper, Tactical, and Vanguard, each with their own loadout, though you can work to change that, as well as special equipment, that they alone have. For example, jetpack, storm shield, iron halo, camo cloak, launcher, and otherwise. The only place I noticed this was missing is the single player campaign really just has Titus having his particular armor and then the ability to get new weapons as you find them within the game world story. I would have liked a bit more variation there. Now, regardless when you're working through the operations or the multiplayer itself, as you level up, you gain experience as well as currency to unlock and outfit various items for the different space Marines. Armor pieces, you have greaves and breastplates and backpacks, are earned by completing successful missions in PvE modes 
and PvP modes, with each piece requiring multiple sets of seven successful missions to unlock. Since each armor piece has its own unlock schedule, for example, one may unlock on your second mission that's successful and then seven later, and another may unlock three and ten, it can be a little bit confusing what's unlocking when, so just keep track of everything. It does give you a little alert when you hover over any of the pieces. Additionally, you can unlock chapters and their associated colors, including some unknown foundings and Chaos Marine chapters as you level up and earn those points. It's crucial, again, to remember that only successful missions or PvP missions count for unlocking the armor. Failing a mission still grants experience and points for each purchase, but armor unlocks specifically demand success because, let's be honest, Space Marines do not reward failure. Each Marine class also gains perks in gear and team and core, and the other was finisher, and these categories allow for you to level up. As each goes up a level, it unlocks a new skill, and you can choose to buy those skills or just keep the points and not buy them. Each class has a specific set of skills, and some of them can impact the entire team specifically, while others just make them more of a value in specific situations. Weapon customization also plays a significant role in here, shaping your Marine's effectiveness not only in combat, but again, sometimes in healing or other aspects, with each weapon tracking your mastery with it. The more you use it, the better you know it until you master that weapon and can move to another. Each weapon type comes with a range of typical attribute bonuses that you would expect plus one to damage kind of stuff. There are some other upgrades you can get by doing particular challenges. Here's the thing, though. I like the idea and concept, but I will say this is a lot. Having experience, then each armor item, unlocking at a different number of successes, then also having entire suits of armor, unlocking on their own number of successes, combination with mastery points and mastery awards, it can be a bit much. This layered system, especially of armor and skills and weapons, means that building an effective team isn't just about the individual power, but also about creating right combinations depending on what you're doing. Experimenting with different setups does make the game feel different, which I definitely like. The parry system soon becomes pretty second nature as well, and you find yourself seamlessly twisting and turning, countering strikes with power sword. And the absence of that HUD as I played it did not hinder the experience, which pretty much stunned me. Instead, it immersed it. You can have the HUD cranked up. You can certainly do that. But I suggest if you get a chance, try playing with it off and seeing if you like it. PvP was hard to get into with a smaller stable of reviewers playing this as most were at PAX or completing the main story. I did have two people I jumped into consistently with, though, and over 40 attempts total across multiplayer sessions that were PvE. It was about 40 attempts with four that had issues where I would have to reset a mission to get them to be able to join. Once they either left or trying to get somebody in while you're doing a mission, it seemed a little bit finicky there. Definitely an easier state of situation than we had with their original game, but something to be well aware of. And seeing if I like it is what matters with these reviews, and that's fun factor. As I said earlier, there were some issues with the sound. There were a couple problems with some texture pop in, and the bots weren't the greatest, especially when you were doing one player with two others. And having these stupid shipbirds steal failure right out of the jaws of success is about as fun as zipping up your nuts in the world's toothiest zipper. Despite some bumps in the road, it's easily the most fun I have had in a action game in this year. From the Wicked campaign, the excellent MP, the operations, the PvE, it just sings. The story is over the top. It's futuristic America F yeah kind of story, but it also takes into account the Ultramarines history a bit, as well as the main characters. And it just feels like everything fits together. It really will depend on if someone's going to dive into the meta or not. Also be aware, in particular, note for the PvP. While a lot of people were playing and I was able to jump into PvE or have people jump into mine, PvP was a little leaner, so the ability to test that wasn't as robust as I would like for this. So, as always, if you're going to jump into a title like this, particularly just for the PvP as one tier of what they offer, be aware of that and we'll probably have some ups and downs as they get everything working, in particular in these first couple days. As you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for a sale, wait for a deep, deep sale, or never touch rating system. As you can probably tell, of course, this is definitely worth getting. I absolutely enjoyed it. Don't feel ripped off. Had a great time playing it, even with some bumps in the road that I encountered. As the other little issues that cropped up, I still absolutely enjoyed my time. It was a phenomenal experience, and I love that. So that's it for me. If you guys get a chance, subscribe to the podcast on the new podcast channel. I like to do my reviews with no sponsored bullshit in longer than two minutes. If you like this channel, subscribe. Remember, no paid for trips, no going to Disneyland to look at games. Just me, the game, and my opinion. Sounds like we have a hunt, brothers.
We can hold this position, lords. We'll keep the swarm off your backs while you hunt back me. I would leave it to a lingering death under there were it not still directing the swarm. <laughs> 